Thank you, uh, Eric and Aaron. Let's start at the beginning of my sailing career. It all started during my first tour in the Coast Guard in Rockland, Maine. Did I at this time know that how to sail? Absolutely not. But I told my girlfriend at the time that I would take her day sailing and she accepted and never questioned me on my ability or knowledge and thought that, well, just because I was in the Coast Guard that, well, I must know everything about boats and sailing. Well, it went okay. But I realized after that trip that my knowledge of sailing and planning was greatly lacking. I really needed to learn how to sail and where to go and how to get there and what to bring and more. I had this one time wonderful experience and realized that there's a lot to do just to day sail around a pond or a bay or let alone the ocean or even more, let alone sail around the world. So today, after sailing most of my life and many thousands of miles and in many different kinds and sizes of boats, both sail and power, I thought that sharing this learning experience with you on how to plan and prepare yourself for sailing, especially offshore, would be very beneficial. Am I going to cover everything you need to know? No, but I will give you a place to start. Preparing for offshore cruising, the results of uncertainty and predictability. When we began to prepare and plan for our dream cruise and a trip around the world, little did we realize how things can change in a moment, thereby changing all aspects of our plans. Sailors, boaters, and those who travel a lot are used to uncertainty and have devised ways to deal with it. But cruising adds a new dimension to uncertainty. So remember that and about what the cruise is all about. So changes in their, and their effect on you and the trip. Changes of weather, crew, mechanical or electrical or host of other things can and will affect the outcome of your planned cruise. Can you plan for these things? Not in all cases, but maybe in some cases. Well, maybe. Sailors and boaters and those who travel a lot are used to uncertainty, but this will be somewhat difficult and different in scope and outcome. What I mean here is that schedules may change due to unforeseen circumstances or family issues or an event that happens out of your control, such as a recent pandemic. So planning your cruise must include the aspect of uncertainty. So questions to ask yourself just right from the beginning. Why are you interested in going cruising? What drives you in this direction? Reading books on sailing and those who have been there and done that or just want to get away from the job, family, or, or want new experiences to see how others live. What do you want out of the cruise? That's probably one of the biggest questions you're going to have to ask yourself. And where do you want to go? The world belongs to you. For how long do you want to go? For weeks? months, years, or even until the money runs out. Do you want to do it at full-time or part-time? Uh, met others doing both, and both were happy at what they wanted. But think about these questions as we go through this presentation today. The big question is, am I and the crew and the boat, that's it. Are we all ready to go? So preparing is primarily getting yourself ready for a life-altering event. No matter how much you plan, you must be prepared for anything. After all, it's an adventure that you ask for, and it's an adventure that you want to enjoy, and it's an adventure you want to complete. Carol owned a Hans Christian 37, and I a Valiant 40. We met in Long Beach, California at a single sailor event, and while dating and getting serious, we decided to sell the Hans Christian and prepare the Valiant 40 for our dream cruise. We prepared the Valiant 40 and ourselves for what we considered some of the things that could happen. And this is just the tip of our training and plannings. 
What is important to you is to have a safe, fun cruise. You must get the boat and the crew ready, and how you do it is your decision. Common sense plays an important part in your decision process. The following is a partial list of items that needed to be added or replaced. First and foremost, the hull had to be remanufactured at the Valiant factory, and I'll show you why in a few minutes. We had to order new sails, monitor wind vane from Scanmar Marine, and then take care of a mass corrosion on the foot of the mast and cut off three inches because of the mass corrosion, so then it required new rigging. Added a 60-pound Bruce and a 60-pound CQR, and that was because of where we were thought about going cruising and those anchors would be the best for us. Electric windlass with a manual override, ham and single sideband HF radios and three VHF radios. And most of your cruiser's nets are on ham radios, so that's why we bought the ham radio. A satellite receiver for satellite data, life raft and spare canister, Outboard for dinghy and then for refrigeration and freezer, we had to add that because we had none. We had to add cockpit cushions for some comfort in the cockpit. Also an autopilot and radar, a wind generator and four solar panels because we wanted to be energy efficient and not have to be tied up to a dock at all times for power. A hard dodger to mount the solar panels on and a new chain plates because of the mast and the other things that were corroded. A new mainsail track, four 8D gel cell batteries for the house bank, a new engine starting battery, dual Raycor fuel filters, which proved to be very beneficial, and three GPS units for the oven, the cockpit, and the nav station, and a water maker, and lots of spare parts. Should have added a spare heat exchanger, and we'll talk about that in a little while. A new bilge pump, manual and electric, sail, engine and refrigeration and repair materials, parts and manuals, tools that we didn't have, removed one AC unit from the boat and spare nuts and bolts and bolts and nuts and more. Case scenarios, let's run through some here. So here are some areas that I feel are important in preparing yourself and the boat for your cruise. If you must abandon the vessel, what must be ready at all times? Abandon ship bag, food, water, clothes, your personal leave herb for each crew member and more. And during the night, you drag anchor and are heading for the beach. What will the sequence of events be that will be needed and to be followed? And does your life raft have enough room for all the supplies or should you add more space? We did. We added a permanent abandoned ship bag, the canister that you see in the slide on the other side of the Givens life raft. Between those two was a 30 foot stainless steel cable that allowed the life raft to be thrown over the side and inflate and have attached to it our abandoned ship bag. If the captain or crew member go overboard and are lost, what will be your new chain of command? Who else is who's going to be in charge? And are they qualified? Your water maker breaks down and do you have spare parts? And are the water tanks full, hopefully, all the time? So some worst case scenarios, some more of them. The boat is struck by lightning and you lose all your electronics and the ability to navigate using GPS and electronic charting. You lose your rudder and cannot steer the boat. Got materials and equipment to fix a jury rig? Scanmar Marine has that. Also, your anchor fouls on the bottom and it must be raised. And do you have a way to free it without going into the water? Scanmar Marine came up with that fix for me, of course, after the fact. A crew member breaks an arm or a leg. Are you and your crew members all versed well enough in first aid to aid that individual in getting comfortable until you can get to true medical treatment? Those are some really important questions. So let's have another thought. As we all know or have heard that going offshore is going to be looked at as an unpredictable at any time and anywhere. That's pretty, I think you can all agree on that. 
But once you leave the safety of near shore sailing and venture out of the sight of land, it becomes even more important to be ready for anything. You cannot plan for all the issues or the problems, but you can get the mind working on what ifs and the unexpected. So the human side of planning is pretty important because it entails all of us. Are all the crew members and the captain ready for this adventure? Are they well trained? Are they well educated in what's going to happen? Do they have the knowledge and the ability to use it? Are you ready to live in tight quarters and forever moving quarters? Something that's always moving around is your boat. Can you, can you stay there aboard for long periods of time and say, this is wonderful? Is privacy going to be a big issue for you? Because if it is, well, you might want to reconsider. Are you a creature comfort type of individual? And if you are, again, you might want to re reconsider or say, I can grin and bear it. Have you spent time sailing and living aboard? If not, you may want to take some nice long weekend cruises or a week cruise or something like this or once in a while to get used to spending time aboard the boat and seeing what's what and how you're going to work and how you're going to work around all the little small issues that you're going to run into. These questions are only a primer to all you're going to ask yourself. It is not a daunting task, but these and additional questions must be dealt with and you will have a lot more than these. Ask yourself and the cruising partners what they are looking for in a trip. Do they have a say in where you want to go? Can all the wishes be met? And who's going to say no to those things that are not part of your plans? And who is the ultimate person in charge? And there is a second or a co-captain. And are, is that second or co-captain is well qualified? as the captain. And something that's really important, I think, especially going offshore, is carrying a lot of food, but will fish be a part of your diet? And are all the crew okay with fish sometimes? Living on your voyage. When the big day comes, enjoy it. Make it a big deal. Because it is. And your life will forever be changed by what you are about to do. The boat will not be ready, but well, that's going to be okay. Is it ever going to be ready? Probably not. The project list will forever be ever with you. And this is a known fact. So this is a picture of Carol and I on our my retirement day and my uniform and her nice dress. And 15 minutes later, we were changed out of that into tennis shoes, shorts, t-shirt, and a baseball cap. Were we ready? You better bet we were. When we set sail, I had retired at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock we were sailing in the Pacific. Just as we passed through the breakwater and into the Pacific, a whale breached just off our starboard side. What was what a symbol that was and the happiness and the safety that we it, it recommended. But as also to us, a good omen of things to come. So long range cruising is all about fixing your boat in exotic places. We, as for most of you, will be, this will be a normal occurrence. So let's talk about some critical items that uh, at least in my book, and this is the only a partial list and, and see if you can agree with these or are, are critical items on your boat. Rigging in chain plates. Well, without, without the mast staying up and the chain plates holding them in place, I would say yes. The engine and charging system has got to work and work perfectly. If not, well, you may want to put that system uh, as a uh, critical item. Your steering and the ability to maintain your steerage and steering should be extremely critical. And the sails have to be in really good shape when you start out because they are going to get worn as you cruise. Anchors, 
you need to find out what kind of anchors you're going to need for the places that you're going to be going to make sure that you have the right ones on board. And the life raft, well, I would recommend a life raft. And if there's just two of you on board going cruising, then a, a four-person life raft is absolutely perfect for you. Two people, a two-person life raft is awfully tiny. So I would recommend going into a boat show and or a, a life raft company and saying, let me sit in your two-person two or your four-person or your six or your eight, whatever they have, and see what size you want. Because you could be in a very small space for a very long time. And then self-steering devices, for instance, a monitor wind vane or another wind vane of another company to help you and take over the steering while you relax and enjoy and prepare meals and take pictures and do whatever else you're going to take. And so MVPs are most valuable parts in IMHO is my, in my humble opinion. Here's a list of MVPs for you to consider adding. And for us, it was a water maker, solar panels, a wind generator, a wind vane monitor self-steering device, a life raft radios and HFV and VHF and ham radios. And when adding MVPs, make sure that, well, they are really needed. So Bob's second comment, in our book was the psychological aspect of long distance cruising can be as interesting as a pragmatic side of keeping a boat going. So let's see what he means by that. Purchasing a new or older boat. Purchasing an older boat has the advantages when you are getting her ready, you will know her inside and out. And I can testify to that 100% because before we met, I had found yellow rose in Texas in this condition. Doesn't look bad from there, but you get up close and you find over 500 holes through the hull below the waterline. There were, it was one of the original nine blister boats from, from uh, the value had made up in, in Washington state. And the second owner didn't know what to do with them, so he pulled the boat out of the water. He didn't really want to go sailing anyway, and he and a couple of Mexican friends put used a sledgehammer and a cold chisel and made 500 holes through the hole below the waterline. Took care of the blisters, but, well, almost destroyed the boat. The mast uh, was, uh, base was corroded, and so we had to cut off three inches and added new rigging when well, we hadn't added new rigging. But she was a beautiful vessel that needed to be found and put back together. You can also find one that, well, just came back from cruising, and that would be a very good option for you because the boat is proven, first of all. Uh, the people who own it can tell you what kind of a trip they had, and all you may have to do is replace some of the electronics or some of the gear on board to meet the current standards, but, well, that might be one of your best boats, best buys. And you can also find a bare one, bare bones one, one that just needs a facelift. In other words, she's been sailing, just say, in Puget Sound or Chesapeake Bay or along the Gulf of Mexico, not offshore very far, but just, just for weekends and maybe a couple days here and there. But she's really appeared pretty bare, bare bones to go cruising in. Or you can buy a new one. That'd be an expensive option. We departed. So that remember that one with 500 holes in it. Now is absolutely a beautiful streamlined yacht that sails like a dream. Inside and out, she is a brand new boat. From a 1976 Valiant 40 derelict. Well, well made, great sailboat that is still sailing the world today. And today she is called Brick House is now sailing around the world with Rebecca and Patrick Childress on it. That name, that may, may, those names may mean something or to you because you may have seen them on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, so let me just read a, an email I just got from them a couple of days ago um, about where they are and what they're, what's going on with them. They said, hey, guys, thanks for posting our blog and YouTube site on your web page. It is our honor to carry on with your beautiful boat. I like how Bob Perry th 
thought you himself. Cruising really is about fixing your boat in exotic places. We find the same is true decades later on Yellow Rose, a.k.a. Brickhouse. I guess that's why we started the YouTube channel, to show all the fun we were having fixing our boat in exotic places. We leave Richards Bay, South Africa, next week after eight-plus months of fixing the boat here and going on a hell of a lot of safaris, too. Loved your book. You had so many adventures on our favorite girl. So there you are. That boat is still going strong. It's a 1976 boat, so it's 40-some years old now, and it's still going strong around the world. So what's important to you? What is important to you is to have a nice, safe, fun cruise that will enrich your lives. We want you to grow internally. You must get the boat and the crew ready, and how you do it is your decision, not mine. Common sense plays an important part in your decision process, and you may seek others' opinions, but ensure it's the best idea. You may find people coming up to you at boat shows or anywhere else saying, oh, you're going to go cruising. You need this and this and this and this and this and that, and oh, my gosh. So if you go out and buy all this, 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 and that, you're going to say, well, after you get all of it aboard, you're going to say, why did I do that? I don't think I need all this stuff. So be careful what other people tell you, say thank you, and then you do the research and see if it's really what you want. So plans change for the better or for the worse. The following are three events that were not planned for our changed cruise or our cruise for the worst. Yes, there were other events that changed for the worst and a lot of for that better for if you wanted to say the truth. But I just wanted to provide you with three examples of the worst kind. And the first one is a sailing, but sailing in the beginning, our start of our cruise to go around the world. We had planned on, and you look at the blue line on the chart, you'll see that, well, we wanted to go to Hawaii. And then on from there, we were going to sail to a wedding, and then we were going to sail up to uh, Alaska, do the Alaska chain all the way back down through Canada and then North America, all the way down to Panama Canal, hit the Galapagos Islands, and then head across to the South Pacific. Well, things changed. The weather when we left was absolutely perfect, and we could follow our route to Hawaii. Winds were 8 to 10, and the seas 3 to 10 on perfect uh, direction. By the second day, the seas had picked up to 10 to 15 feet, plus the wind did a, a little bit change, and we had to, um, we could not maintain our current course, so we had to change our course, and you can see the red line going out and coming back, and that's where we ended up after three days out. So we turned around and went back to San Diego. When we got back, we'd heard it was the El Nino year. We never heard that on a weather report that before we left, so we went um, without that knowledge. So the weather was going to be only getting worse instead of getting better. Setting against the California current to Seattle and then north, setting Alaska current was thought about so we could get to Alaska, but we dismissed that. So we were contacted by a Coast Guard cutter in Hawaii who had just made the trip, and they did not recommend a trip for us at this time to Hawaii. So the results is we returned to San Diego to regroup and decided on heading south to Mexico, and then the Panama Canal, and then head west to the South Pacific. The next one you see is a, uh, it's called One Foot on the Beach. Where we are sailing is in Mexico. We are sailing in the Gulf of Tehuantepec. One of the biggest events that had a direct impact, not only on the vessel, but on us as well, is it taxied, taxed all we could do to come out ahead of the game, was crossing the Gulf of Tehuantepec. For those who are not know, do not know much about the Gulf of Tehuantepec, it's offshore, many hundreds of miles, is where hurricanes are formed. But also the winds from the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, along the Tehuantepec come out of the Caribbean on the western si eastern side of Mexico, and they head west through the uh, mountain range out there, and they come through it to, say, 15 to 20 knots, which is a regular good, nice wind to sail in. 
But by the time they get in through that uh, that mountain range that's called the Venturi effect, those winds now pick up to 60 or 70 miles an hour or less, 40, 50, 60. So we were going to be faced with that if we had to go across the Gulf, and we did. So getting it wrong can be very dangerous if you head offshore. The seas can be bigger, the winds can be stronger, and uh, it's not going to be as pleasant. We had been experiencing engine overheating problems for several weeks due to the faulty heat exchanger on the engine that was passing fresh water directly into the salt water cooling tube. I think I mentioned earlier that we should have bought a heat exchanger, a spare. We were making six gallons an hour of fresh water and dumping it into the engine just to keep it cool. We needed a smooth sea with 10 to 15 knot winds to get across this area. And we had to mo a motor sail and got into within three miles of the beach and were slammed with 20 to 60 knots of wind on the beam. So we sailed one foot on the beach for the next three days, just off the breaker line in 10 to 15 feet of water to be in the safe side and the calm water and to anchor if need be. Were we ready for this? Absolutely not. But our choices were worse going offshore in these conditions. So be prepared for the worst. And when it hits you, you are ready. And the last one that I wanted to thank, bring to you, these are not negatives. These are just things that you should be aware of because they did actually happen to us and they can happen to anybody. You see a line there, a red line of, of our cruise down through um, uh, Point Amala, Panama. We had an individual who wanted to go sailing with us, a relative. So sailing with relatives or those close friends who want to be a part of your adventure can be a blast or a disaster. And this will be one of the most challenging decisions one must make because it can be a wonderful experience or one from hell. Carol had an in-law who really wanted to come and sail a portion of the trip and who said he had lots of experience. I had never met him, so I did not know. He set a date and a destination, when and where to pick him up and take him through the Panama Canal. Remember, we are not going through the Panama Canal. We are just going to go there and pick up spares, food and water, and then head off to the Galapagos. He never told of us of his planned arrival and departure dates, and we only got mail once every several months, and so we did not have all the data. And when we did find out his scheduled dates, it was too late for him to change, and we said, okay, big mistake on our part. We were still in Guatemala enjoying a cruising lifestyle and in no rush to get anywhere fast or have a deadline. Our next stop would be the Bay of Fonseca and then Costa Rica. And Well, Van wanted to be picked up on Bahia, Belina, Costa Rica, on a set date. And he already had his round trip tickets, we found out later, and he would be, and we would be the losing people on this, not him. He would come out the winner. Well, we made it, and we tried to make the most of it, but never went back to see what we had missed. His purpose of his trip was to go through the Panama Canal and then catch a flight home already booked and date set. He was not experienced. He demanded service of meals and a cigar and a cockpit every evening along with a scotch afterwards. And each, um, uh, each morning he wanted his breakfast in the cockpit. He even ran the boat over a reef. If you look on the, on the chart, you'll see it's like a finger or an arm coming out with a finger at the end. Well, that's where the reef was. The chart said the reef was over 20 feet deep, but we felt that, that we didn't know how accurate that chart could be. So he said he wanted to do some night sailing with us. And I said, sure, you can take it from here to here and we'll sleep and then you can... Uh, you can steer the boat. Here's you can have here's gonna take your fixes every fifteen minutes like we normally do when we're getting close to something. Um also I want you to do this course change, this one and this one and this one, and we'll go around and take us around the reef. He said, I can do that. Woke up in the morning, went back and looked at the log because he had to record all his uh, changes and his positions. 
and he did not change course at all. We went over the top of the reef. It could have been the end of all of us, including the boat. But that's one thing that he said he could do, and, well, he didn't. He got through the canal, by the way, not on Yellow Rose, and he made his flight home. He was the winner. We were not. So finally, take time and create a well-thought-out trip. You cannot envision all that could happen or experience. Be prepared as best you can be. You can't always cover all your bases. Choose sailing guests very, very carefully and make sure that they are have some kind of training in what they want to do or what you're going to be doing. It's not possible to anticipate all of the contingencies that are available. Just you cannot do that. Remember what the cruise is about. It's about a dream to come true for you and the crew. And life is a one-way trip, so make the most of it and follow your dreams and find my island. And I'll tell you what my island is later. We plan and left room for enjoying places we visited. And we could have envisioned all the things, but no, we didn't. So answer the questions for yourself. Why? Why do you want to go cruising? Why do you want to do this whole, this whole thing of going somewhere else in the world by boat? Once you're satisfied with it, you have the answer for that, why are you interested in doing it? It's a different question, a different answer. And what do you want to get out of it? What's your end goal for going cruising and going around the world or going here or going there, wherever you're going to go on your cruise? What do you want to get out of it? And where do you want to go? And for how long? Full time? Or part-time. We met couples who were sailing both full-time and part-time, and we both were having a ball. So think about this as you prepare for your voyage to my island. I want to thank you all for, for coming, and may you all make your dreams come true and stay safe and in the place that makes you happy. May you find your island, which is wherever you find your happiness. May you make your dreams come true and stay safe and be happy. Our book is at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Books a Million, but the best price, by the way, is in free shipping and an autograph comes from our website. You get another opportunity to write that down in a, in a few moments. The book will enable you to see details on how he did just what we, I talked about here. We learned as we cruised, and that's an important concept. And if you would like to read more and have a cruising guide to Mexico, to Panama, and to points east, this book will take you there. Not, uh, not much was left out in terms of a sailor, according to Bob Perry. <laughs> Oh, the 
Say 